Today we begin a two-part series called The Greatest Sermon. And today's part one of that series. It's a sermon that was preached nearly 2,000 years ago by the Apostle Peter. And his sermon was so good that at the end of the sermon, people shouted out and cried out to Peter, what do we do now? And 3,000 people were baptized on that day. The church grew from 120 people to 3,120 in one day. And that was that very first New Testament Pentecost. And what happened was there's people coming in from all around the world to Jerusalem for this festival. And I want to share with you portions of scripture from chapter 2 and and break this down. And and today we're going to just do the first part of this. We're going to see a major component of what comprises a great sermon. It starts out in chapter 2, verse 1. When the day of Pentecost arrived, they were all together in one place. And suddenly there came from heaven a sound like a mighty rushing wind. And it filled the entire house where they were sitting. And divided tongues as a fire appeared at them and rested on each of them. They were all filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak in other tongues as the Spirit gave them utterance. So you have all these people gathering. And there's a number of the disciples gathered together too. And they began to speak in different languages as the Holy Spirit filled them and allowed them to speak the message of the gospel to people in different languages. And the people were amazed. If you read on further, I'm going to kind of share what happens. It lays out all the different types of nationalities that were there, and they were filled with amazement. But some thought, they're just drunk. They're just acting silly. It kind of leads up now to where Peter begins this amazing sermon. It's in verse 14. But Peter, standing with the eleven, lifted up his voice and addressed them. Men of Judea and all who dwell in Jerusalem, let this be known to you and give ear to my words. For these men are not drunk, as you suppose, since it is only the third hour of the day. But this is what was uttered through the prophet Joel. And so Peter begins his sermon. It says he addresses the men, but really he's addressing everybody who was there. Men, women, children, all different age groups, different ethnicities. He's addressing them. And he says these words from the Old Testament, from the prophet Joel. It goes on in verse 17. In the last days it shall be, God declares, that I will pour out my spirit on all flesh. And your sons and your daughters shall prophesy. And your young men shall see visions. And your old men shall dream dreams even on my male servants and female servants. In those days I will pour out my spirit, and they shall prophesy. And I will show wonders in the heavens above, and signs on the earth below, blood and fire and vapor and smoke. The sun shall be turned into darkness, and the moon to blood, before the day the Lord comes, the great and magnificent day. And it shall come to pass that everyone who calls upon the name of the Lord shall be saved." And so, in any great sermon, there's always quoting of Scripture. And what Peter is doing here, he's going back to the Old Testament, the prophet Joel. And Joel prophesies that in the future, the Holy Spirit is going to come upon all people. And people are going to see visions, they're going to prophesy, which means they're going to speak God's word in ways that make a lot of sense. There's going to be dreams that people have. In fact, even think, for example, of Joseph, the father, the stepfather of Jesus, how he had these dreams and he followed them, dreams that came from God himself. And so the Holy Spirit is going to work in very interesting ways to lead and guide and direct, but ultimately the direction the Holy Spirit is trying to lead people, it ties in with this last verse, verse 21. It shall come to pass that everyone who calls upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. So the Holy Spirit is working to lead us to faith in Jesus Christ. That everyone who calls upon Jesus will be saved. And the reality is no one can say that Jesus Christ is Lord except by the Holy Spirit. And so for there to be a great sermon, there has to be involvement of the Holy Spirit. And on this Pentecost Sunday, I think it's so important for us to talk about who the Holy Spirit is and what the Holy Spirit does. You know, I'm convinced that for we, particularly as Lutheran Christians, we do a good job of talking about God the Father. And we do a good job of talking about Jesus. But so often we don't do a really good job of talking about the Holy Spirit. 
I'm convinced that the Holy Spirit is so often underestimated. This is how God works in his Holy Spirit, to lead us again to faith in Christ, and Christ lead us to faith and believe in God. And the Holy Spirit, as Martin Luther says so specifically, for those of us that went through training in confirmation or maybe adult instruction, the Holy Spirit calls, gathers, enlightens, and sanctifies. And these words are very important. It's all part of a great sermon, and understanding a great sermon, and living out that sermon. The Holy Spirit calls us into the faith. Again, without the Holy Spirit, we cannot believe. As it said in 1 Corinthians 12, 3, no one can say Jesus Christ is Lord except by the Holy Spirit. You know, in ourselves, we are spiritually blind, but it's the Spirit working through the Word and working through the sacraments, as we talked about last week, that leads us to faith in Jesus Christ, that we in turn can believe, understand through Jesus we are forgiven, our sins taken away, the way to heaven is open for us. It's the work of the Holy Spirit that calls us into this faith. And the Holy Spirit wants to lead all people to believe in Jesus. There's only one unforgivable sin. It's called sin against the Holy Spirit. And that's rejecting Jesus at the point of our death. If people reject Jesus when they die, they're rejecting what the Holy Spirit's been trying to do, which is to lead us to faith in Jesus Christ. And that's the only unforgivable sin. The most important thing in our lives is to come to an understanding of who Jesus is. There's two kinds of people in the world, those who believe in him and those who do not. And it makes all the difference in time and eternity to make sure that we understand him for who he is, that he is Savior, he is Lord, he's the Christ. And it's the Holy Spirit has brought us into this faith. For many of you, you believe since the time of your baptism. Some of us, we came to faith in other parts of our life. But it's the Holy Spirit that drew us into believing. He calls us, he gathers us. Gathers together in the Christian church. It's breaking my heart to see what's happening in Christianity in America today. Just in the 30 plus years of ministry that I have been a part of, during that time, across our country, worship attendance has gone from about 40 to 50 percent of all people attending each weekend now to less than 17 percent before COVID. And now they're believing maybe another third is not going to come back to be involved in worship again. And I hope that's not the case. I pray it's not the case. Because we're not meant to go through life alone. The so Bible says we're sheep and the devil's a wolf, a lion. We need comfort and support of the flock and ultimately the great shepherd. We're left by ourselves so often we're going to stray. And our minds are going to go in the wrong directions. We need Christian support. And even as COVID is beginning to slow down, I want to encourage them ready to all get back into live worship again. We're still going to have resources like this, and you know, maybe some of you are unable to make it to church. And you can always watch the videos, or maybe you go to worship, you want to watch the video again, which is great. But the reality is we need the support of other people. Or maybe to gather with other Christian people you know and talk about these sermons or, or talk about faith. You know, my daughter has this, a dog, it's, her name is Leia. She's an Australian Shepherd. And this dog just loves to herd anything and anyone. In fact, you know, we used to have a swimming pool. And that dog would try to keep us away from the water and try to herd us, keep us together, at the same time keep us away from the water. And even the other dogs. It was kind of fun to watch, but then we still went in the pool, and eventually this dog, even though they're not swimming dogs or water dogs, jumped in the water and tried to hurt us out of the water. In fact, the dog began to love being in the water, but all the time this dog is trying to herd people, keep them together, and herd them in the direction that she thinks they should go. Well, the Holy Spirit's like that. The Holy Spirit's guiding us, herding us, keeping us together as a flock that we have one another, we support of one another, that we don't go through life alone. We need people in our lives to hold us accountable and we hold them accountable because in ourselves we can so easily stray. Calls, gathers, enlightens. You know, before I believed in Jesus, I could try to read the Bible, it made no sense to me, it was like foreign language. 
But once I came to faith, once the Holy Spirit led me to faith, the Bible began to make sense. And the more I grow in my faith, the more the Bible makes more sense. It's because the Holy Spirit's enlightening my mind, helping me to understand what these words mean. I could read a verse a thousand times, and a thousand and first time, all of a sudden, something else jumps out. The Word of God is so amazing. And I'm praying that every one of us has taken time to be consistently studying the Word because we need that. And the more that the Word becomes a part of our life, the more we're going in the right direction, the more life makes so much sense, the more faith keeps growing. And not just knowing the Word, but living it out, enlightening us. You know, I think back when I first got glasses, I didn't think I needed them. I was in eighth grade and I was all concerned about having to wear them. I even told the doctor, I said, you know, I don't need these. He says, put them on. And so I, I put those glasses on, I was like, wow, I can, I can see. I didn't realize that I was, my sight had gone so bad, it happened so gradually. The same way the Holy Spirit helps us to see God's word in a deeper way, to keep growing in that faith and, and then seeing the reality of life for what it really is, more through the lenses of God and his word and the Holy Spirit, rather than being led astray by this world. We become more discerning, calls, gathers, enlightens, and then sanctifies, which is the application of the word being holy. It's living out the Ten Commandments, not because we have to, but we're being empowered by the Holy Spirit to do so. And then from that, love begins to flow more and more. God is love. God is holy. He's perfect. And as we grow in faith, sanctification means to be made holy. Our lives become more holy. Through Christ, we're made perfect. We are holy through him. But now our desire through this faith we have is to express it in our lives, to want to become more like Jesus, to live lives that are holy, lives that are sanctified. And the Holy Spirit wants to help us in that process calls, gathers, enlightens, and sanctifies the whole Christian church. Many years ago, I was taking a sabbatical, and I'd gone through some really rough times in my life. And the church gave me three months, and I was taking that time to go to different churches and trying to learn and grow and just heal from what I'd gone through. And there was a Sunday where I went to two different churches, and it was about 11 o'clock. And I thought, maybe I should go home. But I realized there was this church at 11.30 service. And so I arrived at that church just before it started, and there was hardly anybody in the sanctuary. And on that day, the pastor actually wasn't there. It was a video sermon. And I was worshiping, and then he began to preach this video sermon. They started playing it. And it's like the pastor was talking directly to me, like God was talking directly to me. It's like hitting all the areas that I was struggling with and hurting and just sharing how much we're loved in Jesus Christ. We're loved so unconditionally and, and the words were hitting me and thank God there was no one sitting around me because I was just crying, tears pouring down my eyes and just all the stuff coming out of me. And then we had some closing songs and just, I just felt like, wow, this, this is incredible. The Holy Spirit was alive in me and the Holy Spirit was alive in that message. And when it comes to a great sermon, that's what happens. When it comes to seeing God's word in deeper ways, that's what happens. It's the Holy Spirit working through the message and the messenger. And the Holy Spirit working in us to connect with that message. And on that day when Peter preached his sermon, we're going to see next week, amazing things happened. In fact, next week we're going to be talking more about the exact content within that message. But again, what makes a message powerful is the work of the Holy Spirit. And this Pentecost Sunday weekend, we praise our God, the Holy Spirit. Father, Son, Holy Spirit. And it's the Holy Spirit who calls, gathers, enlightens, and sanctifies us. It makes our lives so much better, not only now, but for all eternity. By directing us, to Jesus Christ and living through him. Let's pray. Lord Jesus, thank you for loving us. That you came and you lived and died and you rose for us. And the reality is, O Holy Spirit, you've helped us to believe in Jesus. You bring us into this faith. You help us to grow in this faith. You help us to gather as your church, to be enlightened in your word and to live lives that are more holy. Holy Spirit, do your work in us. We surrender to you on this Pentecost weekend. And Lord, 
Help us to realize that you live in us. We praise in Jesus' name. Amen.